Hey, welcome to the Sermonary Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Taylor, and I'm here with my friend, Kyle Bashirs. Kyle is a teaching pastor in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, Kyle also finally has a book out. Well, I mean, this is not your first book, but you have a book that you were working on called Apathyism. And we've had you on the show before talking through that book. But before we jump into the practical use of commentaries that we're going to talk about today, give me a, a, a real quick reason why our listeners today need to check out your book, Apathyism, and buy it on Amazon, because I think they should. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I the short answer is there's an growing indifference towards questions related to God and the gospel. And so this book kind of explores um, the cultural conditions that make that kind of a difference possible um, and what Christians ought to do about it. How can you approach your apathetic neighbor with the gospel? It's a really great book for people in your church. So if you're a pastor and you're listening to this, I highly recommend that you recommend this book to people in your church. Maybe you have a a small group or a few small groups go through the book together, but it's really practical on really helping people understand their neighbors and understand the people that they run into every day that not that they hate God, they just have an indifference towards faith and God. And it's just not a big part of their life, which, you know, is kind of the way the world has changed over the last couple of decades. So very practical for the church. Well, Kyle, today I have you on because you're one of the best researchers that I know. Uh, you are, I guess, about to finish your PhD. Uh, and, uh, and, and you've just always been really good at research. Even the weeks that you aren't preaching, uh, we serve together and, and preach together. You would always still provide research help and, and sit back and help other pastors with their research and not only teaching them how to do it, uh, but also, you know, finding really great stuff to use uh, in sermon prep. And so I wanted to have you on to talk through, we've talked through before why pastors should use commentaries. Now I want to talk through how to use commentaries. And, uh, and you've got five tips for us today. And we're just going to jump right into the first one because I was actually going to have you address this issue. But since it's your first tip, uh, then I want you to just jump right into this, to this first tip. Yeah, this tip uh, sounds a little bit more like a why, but it is definitely related to the how. And it's uh, give yourself permission to use commentaries. Uh, I think that some folks wonder why a pastor would need to use commentary. And maybe the concern, which I think is coming from a good place, is, well, isn't scripture sufficient? And isn't the Holy Spirit, who inspired and authored scripture, sufficient for the preaching of the gospel? Uh, and I would say, of, of course they are. Uh, we don't need commentaries to preach the word. We need the testament of old and new. But in reading commentaries, you kind of enter into a fellowship of pastors across space and time. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to ask yourself, like, what does this text mean? And it's a completely different thing to ask Augustine and Calvin and Wesley and Spurgeon and Schreiner, what do you guys think? Um, because, uh, we were talking about it before it was Spurgeon that said it, um, the, well, yeah, yeah he, close, he, it, basically to, to, to sum it up, he said, are you so arrogant to believe that what the Holy spirit has said to you would be different than what the Holy spirit has said to men and women before you? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I would say if the, if the spirit was speaking to godly people in the past and we believe that, well, then let's see what the spirit said to them. That's good. So, so give yourself permission. That's what yeah. I would say. Yeah, that, that's good. And honestly, I think it is something that a lot of pastors struggle with. I've been approached, maybe you've been approached too, but even by people in the church, that when you quote a commentator uh, in your sermon, they've come to me and said, I can't believe you use commentaries. You know, you're squelching the Holy Spirit and those kind of things. And that's just hogwash. You know, it's, you know, there are, there are things about the Bible and, 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 and you're going to get into this more in just a minute, but you know, we weren't there. We aren't, we weren't, we're, we're very, very much removed from ancient culture. And so there are things that we need to rely heavily on commentaries for just to understand the original languages, the context of those things, but you're going to dive into that uh, because you, um, you have some very specific commentaries that you feel like we, uh, kinds of commentaries that we should be moving. But uh, your next tip is um, submit to commentary, submit commentaries to the authority of scripture. Tell me about that. Yeah. So without, you know, going from swinging the pendulum from not using commentaries at all to giving commentaries too much authority. Um, if, if you come in the tradition of the Protestant Reformation, then one of our cries is sola scriptura. 
the, the inspired and errant word of God is the highest authority, uh, or earthly authority that we have. So commentaries do not have the last word on the passage that you're preaching. Um, and and not actually to move that forward, we pastors do not have the last word on the passage that we're preaching. Scripture has the last word on that passage itself. Uh, so I, I think we have to be reminded here that sola scriptura, it doesn't mean Bible only. It means Bible highest. And so when we're reading uh, commentaries, we have to wash uh, all of those commentaries through uh, the authority of scripture. Otherwise, we're giving ourselves over to kind of uh, the wisdom of men. How do you do that? How do you make sure that what you're preaching is not someone else's opinion or not your opinion? How, how do you let scripture have the final say? You know, sometimes a good commentary writer is going to tell you, this is my opinion, or I'm not sure, or this is an issue that could go one way or another. Uh, and then what, what I do is I go back to kind of the core principles of the faith, like kind of the first tier issues. If this commentary is taking me off the rails from those first tier issues, then that's a red flag for me. And I'm going to either back away or I'm going to look at other commentaries to see if there's not a possibility of course correcting. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you have to find ways to submit the commentary to the authority of Scripture uh, before you deliver a sermon that's, you know, using commentaries uh, before your people. That's good. Uh, so your next tip, talk, and this is a, a little bit more practical tip, but you talk about the different types of commentaries that a pastor should be using. Go, go, I mean, because we all have kind of our go-to favorite commentaries that we we use a lot and, you know, we need to make sure that we probably have an array of them. What, what are the types of commentaries that you recommend a pastor use? Yeah. People always ask me like, what kind of commentaries should I use? And my question is, well, what are you trying to do? Right. There's, there's all sorts of different commentaries. It's just like, there's all sorts of different types of vehicles. There's trucks and there's motorcycles and there's cars. And so I found that there's actually four uh, kinds of categories of commentaries that have served me the best. Uh, and the way that I describe them is when it comes to commentaries, I like to get technical, I like to get ancient, I like to get practical, and I like to get elsewhere. And what I mean by that is this, technical commentaries are going to be those that are going to get into the nitty gritty of the language. Uh, they're going to care a lot about exegesis, and they're going to provide some interpretation, but they're probably not going to give you much interpretation. Um, these kinds of commentaries would be like um, NAC or the EEC. Uh, Craigle has a commentary out or commentary series. And then the word biblical commentary kind of goes, begins at the technical and works its way out to uh, more practical. Then uh, get ancient. This is when I think that people often overlook and it's a shame. Um, there's a great commentary series called the ancient Christian commentary on scripture. Uh, and this kind of collects uh, all sorts of different clips of sayings and thoughts and writings of the patristics or the early church fathers about what they thought about specific texts. And you'd be surprised at the amazing gems that are in there. And I'd, I'd also say um, to look to the reformers and to see kind of what they thought, and then your favorite preachers of the past as well to see what they thought. Uh, then I get to get practical. So this is your interpretation of the text, and this is the application of the text. This is the what commentaries are going to help you craft a call to action based on the passage that you've just preached? Uh, and for this, uh, my two go-tos or my favorite are the, the Preaching the Word series and then the Christ-Centered Exposition series are two of my favorite. And then finally, and this is one that might take some nuancing, but um, my very last category of commentaries is what I call Get Elsewhere. And these are commentaries that are written by people that are not a part of my tribe uh, within Protestantism. So for example, I'm preaching through Exodus right now, and I'm using two commentaries, one from Brazos Theological, uh, which is a Roman Catholic commentary, and then one that's called Understanding Exodus, which is actually written by uh, a Jewish uh, uh, religious scholar. Now, I'm not incorporating a lot of what they're telling me, but they do bring out some blind spots for me, and they help me to understand what other people think about this text. So in our church, we have a lot of people that were former Roman Catholic, and it's really helpful to me to know how they were taught the text as they're coming into a Protestant evangelical environment. That, that's really great advice to, to consider who you're preaching to, consider their background. And, you know, we're here in, 
in the South, but in Mobile, and then you go two hours over to New Orleans, you, you have a strong Catholic presence here. Yeah. And, uh, and so in the Protestant church, there are some differences and there's some disagreements. And so, you know, it, it is helpful to know what have people in our church been taught. Uh, so where are they coming from and what is their frame of mind? So that's, a, that's really great advice that I, I, I hadn't even thought about a whole lot of, you know, what is, what is the background from, from people? Uh, so you've got the, these technical, these ancient ones that do give you a little bit more background on the, the subject, what the church father said, you know, church tradition has generally said about these passages. And then you've got those practical ones. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, the, another one that I like is the new, uh, the, the new international, what is it? Yeah. NIV application. It's a great yeah, the NIV. Yeah. The new international yeah. version application Bible uh, is a really great one too. And th these are not just great for interpretation, but also application uh, and helping with application as well. I I would say too, and this is kind of a side note or a footnote, but uh, don't turn your nose up at free commentaries online. I know a lot of people like to make fun of Matthew Henry's commentary, but he's got some really good gems in there. Uh, there's one really famous line that I've heard a lot of preachers use that the same sun that uh, softens the wax, hardens the clay. And that comes from Matthew Henry. So uh, just because it's free and in public spaces doesn't mean that <laughs> there's something wrong with it. So That's good. Um <laughs> So, so then, so you give us that and, and, and your fourth tip uh, kind of aligns with them to read them in the order that you just said, technical, ancient, practical, and then elsewhere. Uh, why is it important to read them in that order? Yeah, I found that there's some wisdom there. Um, if the last commentary you're reading is technical, then a lot of the last finishing touches of your sermon are going to be technical. And what you really want in the last side of your sermon is your call to action. Um, the three questions I like to ask of every sermon of mine is what, so what, now what? And essentially what I'm doing is exegesis, interpretation, and application. And so for that reason, maybe we'll talk about that next, but and so for that reason, I read my commentaries in that order. So the first commentaries I read are the technical ones. Uh, well, actually, let me back up. The first thing I do is I read the text, period, just by myself. I pray about what the church needs to learn from this, what I need to learn from this. And then I write down my own conclusions and applications. And then I juxtapose that to commentaries. Then I get technical. So what's going on in the language? What genre is this? Uh, to whom was it written? Where is it in the immediate narrative? Maybe that context will help me. How is it in the grand narrative of scripture? Once I've gotten technical, then I ask the ancients and the reformers, like, what did you think about this? Um, how did you read this? Then I get practical. Uh, what ought I proclaim over the people now that I have a good grasp of what the text is and that I've considered what people in church history have said? Uh, and then the get elsewhere is kind of, you know, looking out. Are there any blind spots that somebody outside of my tribe might have picked up? Um, are there any, this is something we didn't talk about, but are there even any criticisms of this text that my people might have heard of um, uh, out in culture somewhere that I need to address? Uh, so, it kind of goes in, um, it, it builds upon itself. We'll say that not in order of importance, but basically kind of like setting the foundation, then building the structure. Yeah. So, and, and that, that's, that's great. So knowing the order and then knowing the questions, I mean, that, that ask the questions about commentaries that are specific to your sermon. And we were talking before that and, and, you, and you made a really good point of don't let the commentary direct your sermon. Tell, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, so that's the fifth point. Ask questions of the commentaries that are specific to your sermon and that are specific to your people. So it, this is especially true with um, kind of the more practical or applicable commentaries. They're usually based off of sermon series of pastor theologians, and they had a congregation with a specific need at a specific time that this pastor spoke to. Well, that's not your commentary, or that's not your uh, congregation. And so what you need to do is you need to ask of the commentaries the specific questions about what you need to hear as a pastor and what your people need to hear. Um, and you also ought to ask really broad questions to keep those commentaries, you know, in line with orthodoxy. Um, is this commentary helping me articulate the gospel? Um, does this commentary have, uh, uh, is this commentary convicting me and encouraging me as believers? Is it convicting and converting unbelievers? Is it helping me articulate that message? So those are kind of the two categories of questions that I ask of commentary. Because if you don't ask those questions, you end up following the commentators where they go. And that might not necessarily be the place where the Holy Spirit wants you to go. Um, 
so outside of commentaries, obviously commentaries are the popular thing for pastors to use. It's, it's kind of our go-to. What are some other examples of resources that pastors can use uh, outside of commentaries? That there are all sorts of kinds of resources, and sometimes I think it could even be overwhelming. Um, but I'm a, I'm a big advocate of uh, reading theology, uh, specifically systematic theologies that kind of give us, that, that help us, you know, guard ourselves against wandering too far off into a strange interpretation of a text. Uh, maybe we do it innocently or we're not aware of it. So I would advocate for um, reading theology. Um, I'd advocate for reading uh, biblical studies books as well. Uh, so don't just let the commentator tell you what the ancient world was like. Uh, build that uh, picture and imagine that for yourself. Um, and I would also look for uh, if you're if you're if you're the type of preacher that preaches a specific book of the Bible. Um, then during that season of your preparation and duration of your preaching that book, I would go all in on those commentaries. Uh, get as many as you can, and it's reasonable to read throughout the week to study. Uh, but if you preach from more of a topical perspective, or um, you don't spend as much time on the Bible as you can, uh, books of the Bible, and you go through kind of thematically, then I would recommend bundles of commentaries. Uh, to, to, that way you can get a broader view um, for, frankly, for, for less, because commentaries can uh, become a, an expensive investment. Yeah. Uh, well, and that's a, a great segue into what we're doing with the Sermonary right now, because we've actually taken all of the commentaries that we have inside of sermonary and we've bundled the, them together for i guess i think it's like the next month um where uh, you can get all 66 books of a verse by verse commentary uh, for 97 dollars, which i think is a tremendous deal uh plus we've thrown in some other resources but just just an entire commentary set of 66 books for 97 bucks uh makes it well worth it because um they can be expensive and uh we've you know we we've shared them you know our our, our staff shares has shared commentaries uh amongst one another because they are such an investment but um i, I think that's really great advice uh to uh uh, to invest in, in some good commentaries uh, and not just the same ones over and over again, you know, broaden uh, and, and expand it a little bit. So Kyle, uh, that's really great advice. Uh, we appreciate the five tips um, and we'll probably have you on one uh, to talk more about the book that you've released, because I do want to talk about that from a pastor's perspective and a, and a discipleship and leadership perspective. Um, but uh, also just, just talking some more practical stuff on preaching. I think you're uh, a tremendous teaching pastor. Uh, you're a tremendous researcher and also a great writer. Uh, where can people connect with you? Because I know that you are, uh, you've got a couple of things going on. You've got um, a podcast that you're doing, uh, theology in the middle. Uh, you've got these blogs that you're writing. What are some great ways for people to connect with what you're doing? Yeah, I've I try to consolidate all that. Um, and uh, I never wanted to, to do this, but this is it's like the easiest thing to do. I have a little website now that's just my name, Kyle Bashir's uh, dot com so k y l e b e s h e a r s and um, there it's kind of pointing at all of the other uh, like uh, resources and organizations that I've uh, been been privileged to to contribute to. Good. Well, that makes it easier for us. And we'll put that link in the show notes as well. Also a link to purchase your book, Apatheism, uh, because I highly recommend that for people in your church. Uh, and that is a word that you made up. Uh, apathyism. Oh, so. no, I, I wish it was. I wish it was. Uh, I, but I it's not a real out. word. No, it's not a real word. It's not a really well-known word. We'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, good. Well, I, uh, I appreciate your time today. And I really think that that was helpful for our listeners. If, uh, if you liked it, if you, if, if you found that helpful, just go ahead and tell us in the comments and also uh, post in the comments uh, if you're watching this on YouTube and let us know what some of your practical commentary advice is on how to use commentaries. We'd love to know. And maybe that will be helpful for other people following along. So thanks again, Kyle. Yeah, thanks for having me.